Hi, this is Wes Simpson, founder of LearnIPVideo.com, with another IP Oktoberfest presentation brought to you by AIMS, the Alliance for IP Media Solutions. With me today are David Carroll, founder, and Kevin Gross, media network architect of David Carroll Associates. And they are going to be describing an installation that they recently did for the new Dropbox headquarters in Mission Bay. Welcome, David and Kevin. Thanks, Wes. I appreciate it. Uh, Dropbox came to DCA to uh, help develop a hybrid solution for their new 750,000 square foot flagship headquarters in Mission Bay, San Francisco. Uh, they wanted to serve traditional AV uh, facility uh, requirements as well as generate live video production. Uh, within the facility, there are several key production areas, including a 600 square uh, seat event center, uh, multiple learning and uh, classroom spaces that are used for um, internal education as well as outreach, a uh, sprawling world-class restaurant, which serves as an alternate all hand space, uh, a big usability lab and uh, multiple gathering and workspaces throughout the facility. Dropbox wanted to be able to generate live video content from any of these spaces flexibly uh, and they wanted to uh, concentrate their uh, staff into a uh, centralized uh, production environment uh, for uh, the maximum efficiency. So the solution uh, developed consisted of a combination of fixed and mobile technology uh, with a single shared central machine room and master control, enabling uh, centralized production staff to perform their work efficiently. Uh, the, the use of professional broadcast equipment, uh, including uh, products from Labo, Grass Valley, Riedel, and others, uh, led us into an ST2110 backbone for the uh, production side of things uh, rather than other IP video technologies. Although uh, we do use other um, IP video technologies uh, within the facility uh, to support um, traditional AV presentation technologies. Uh, the project included a lot of uh, AV stuff like projectors all over the place and um, uh, video conferencing technologies such as Zoom. Um, and uh, all of that was uh, built uh, in a network that supported those multiple protocols. And that's really the key to uh, a type of a project like this is to be able to um, handle uh, different protocols for audio video um, control within a network environment that doesn't segment it into so many networks that you can't get device A to talk to device B. At the same time, these uh, IP backbone technologies enable a lot of flexibility to um, move equipment throughout the facility and uh, 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 at a very uh, essentially low cost deliver a much broader uh, reach into the facility with 750,000 square feet. They really wanted to be able to go anywhere and record live video uh, off of the roof, um, the 12th floor in sector one on Monday, the 12th floor in sector four on Thursday. So we delivered a fiber backbone infrastructure using a uh, ribbon fiber solution uh, and a simple uh, BSP with a single connector that uh, broadcast service panel that uh, uh, in approximately 70 locations throughout the, the building. And that enables you to go into a location that otherwise has no AV um, infrastructure built into it, but uh, do a production from there using a mobile cart or a uh, studio camera solution or even just throw up a bunch of monitors for a party or whatever they want to do uh, simply by plugging uh, a mobile uh, rack or cart or camera into that same uh, connector. And that connector carries all of the network services that are required, both for the 2110 solution as well as the uh, uh, traditional uh, AV uh, over IP solutions and uh, control. We're very fortunate to have Kevin Gross as a part of our team, as our network architect, uh, to help deliver this hybrid and converged network that uh, supports 
a project as complicated as this and as successfully. So Kevin, can you give us some of the technical details of how you guys implemented this project? Yeah, let me give you a, a overview of uh, what we call network topology and uh, topology as it relates to how the network components are connected together and topology as to how we distribute uh, synchronization information across the network. Uh, this network's a bit different than many of the uh, 2110 networks in that it's a uh, combined uh, network. It does the 2110 stuff. Uh, we have a bunch of audio applications for, for the site, uh, public address systems and entertainment systems, for instance. Um, and we have uh, corporate and control functions, um, things like message boards for their, their dining rooms and stuff, all on this one network. So uh, when we talk about topology, topology just means how things are connected together. And it's uh, normally expressed in a, in a diagram like uh, you see on the screen here. This here is a uh, typical topology used in I IT, uh, corporate IT, for instance, enterprise IT. We've got at the top, we've got two uh, core switches uh, two of them, so that if one fails, uh, the other one can take over. Uh, and we've got a, a second tier of access switches. This is where all the computers and in, in the case of our audio and media components, uh, those, uh, that's where we plug all that stuff in. Um, so, and the other thing to notice here is we've got one network, uh, everything can talk to everything else. Uh, it's one network, and th that's generally how things are done in uh, corporate corporate installations. Uh, now, this this picture shows a simple topology for how twenty one ten networks are built. Uh, we've got two of these uh, core switches. Um, there's actually uh, two different ways to. Uh, arrange a topology for 2110. Uh, we can take the big iron approach where we have uh, large switches, typically chassis based switches that have multiple slots. And uh, you can slide in line cards with uh, optical transceivers in them and just add as many cards as you need for the requirements of, of building that system. Um, the alternative is uh, spine leaf architecture, which looks more like the, the corporate network uh, in that you have uh, spine switches, which are then connected to leaf switches, which is where you connect your uh, 2110 equipment. So in this simple uh, big iron approach here, we have two separate networks. We have a red network and a blue network. Uh, this is in support of the 2022-7 uh, dual streaming uh, protection scheme. And so we are we have two copies of the media on two separate networks. And if one of the networks fails or one of the connections fail, you still have your media. Now the challenge, we wanted to have this capability in the Dropbox installation, but we also needed to support uh, the audio systems and the more IT sorts of things. Uh, so we have a hybrid network. And so in this diagram, you can see that we're combining uh, the typical sort of IT infrastructure with uh, the 2110 infrastructure. So in this, in this network, we do connect all of our 2110 devices directly to these chassis core switches. And then we, we in addition, have a separate layer of access switches for the more numerous, typically one gigabit connections for audio and, and control and um, other types of devices like that. Uh, so this produces a hybrid network. Um, and the, the, the main difference between this and the typical 2110 network is in this uh, hybrid network, we do have a connection between the red and the blue networks. And um, this does simplify a few things and it also makes things a little more interesting in other areas. Um, 
So uh, I have a separate topic here. I'm going to talk about uh, PTP on a network like this in, in a moment. Uh, first, uh, there's one final aspect to this is that um, this network is not a standalone network. Um, in this diagram, it looks like, in the first diagram, it looks like a standard network. But um, we have some requirements to connect in with the, the corporate network. Um, the, one of the main driving requirements was that uh, some of the applications that we uh, use this network require wireless control. So uh, users of the system may control the system themselves using an iPad to uh, select cameras and such. And uh, so that iPad needs wireless access to this uh, network in order to, to do those control actions. Now we can just set up our own wireless access point uh, dedicated for that, but uh, the, the corporate guys generally don't want unknown wireless ports in their facility. Uh, there's the issue of uh, colliding with the channel scheme that they have, have mapped out. So they really prefer that uh, this type of control happen on their wireless network. Um, and we also have the ability for people at their desks. It's a very dynamic work environment, people moving around all the time. And we want people to be able to access the system from without having to go into the master control room, for instance. So we have this integration with the, the corporate network where we take a top couple of uh, uplinks to their network. And in fact, the whole network is is uh, integrated at that point. Um, there's routing protocols involved, and uh, we have to have to get along with their addressing and routing schemes, uh, which is all best practice stuff. Um, I I said I would talk about PTP topology. Uh, so getting synchronization around is a critical aspect of any of these 2110 systems, um, and with the network with the big iron approach where you have two separate networks, um, we need to be able to still get the same clock onto both networks. So uh, a solution to this problem is, is shown in this diagram where we have the two big iron switches supporting the media devices. We have two grandmaster clocks and each of those grandmaster clocks has a GPS connection. Uh, but we need to, to decide which of those clocks to use. And we need to uh, get the clock information from one side of the network to the other. And uh, so this is done by setting up a special type of link between the two switches. We are not connecting the two networks together, but we do have a PTP connection between the two networks. In the network uh, that we built at Dropbox, we do have the two networks connected together. And so uh, that link between the two switches, it, uh, it uh, carries all kinds of data, including the PTP data. So it serves as that PTP only, but it does only link, but it does more than, than the PTP. Uh, and so we end up with a, uh, again, a hybrid network with uh, two uh, PTP grandmasters. Uh, they can talk to each other over this link. They can use the best master clock algorithm to decide which one is the, the grandmaster. And then that clock information can be distributed uh, everywhere in the network. Uh, so we have uh, the clock information being distributed to the directly connected 2110 devices. And we also have the BTP2 clock being distributed to the access layer switches in this diagram. Uh, and that's for the purpose of synchronizing our audio systems. There's, for instance, a QSYS audio system. There's some Dante stuff going on. Uh, all of those devices need to also synchronize to the master 2110 clock. Uh, and that's done by, by multicasting the PTP messages from the core switches down to those access layer switches and beyond. 
Um, so that's a couple topology. Uh, the the next section, uh, um, I'm just going to go over a few things mostly related to PTP, but other topics also. Uh, we've prepared a, a, a white paper that covers a lot of this in detail. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be able to cover a couple of here. Um, as I mentioned, we have Dante in this network. And so that brings up, uh, brings uh, version one of the PTP protocol in, into play here. And um, version one of, the, of PTP is not compatible with version two, but you can operate both on the same network. Uh, and in theory, they don't interact with each other. Uh, and what we need was to be able to use version one for Dante devices at um, these equipment mach machine room locations. And then uh, any Dante audio would get sent into the QSIS system and then would be retransmitted out as an AES 67 stream uh, to the rest of the network. Uh, but we had uh, the, the uh, version one clock happening locally in those machine rooms. Um, and the trick with uh, getting version one and version two to get along is, is that uh, in your switches that support PTP, you're able to select whether they are supporting version one or version two. And if you set them to version two, uh, they'll either ignore or they'll block version one. Mm. And um, so we use that, that capability uh, in our design to keep the version one uh, PTP within a local machine room. So the switches are set up to support version two, they block version one, and uh, so we can use version one locally, but it doesn't spread to other parts of the system, which may cause, uh, it definitely caused some, some bit of anxiety on part of some vendors they did not want to see PTP version one coming into their devices. Um, so uh, another issue we had uh, was getting PTP to be reliable. And um, PTP can be a sensitive type protocol. Uh, one of the problems that a lot of people have seen is uh, in the best master clock, clock algorithm, deciding who is the, the grandmaster for the network. And uh, we experienced some situations where um, the network was indecisive about, occasionally indecisive about who the grandmaster was. And Trace, the reason for that is that um, the best master clock algorithm re re uh, relies on multicast messages being delivered reliably. Uh, these announce messages that tell you about the, the current grandmaster, if they're dropped in the network somehow, uh, it makes end devices think that uh, there is no grandmaster and someone else tries to take over as, as the grandmaster. It causes a, a glitch in performance. Um, so in our case, we had um, these disruptions um, and it came down to, um, there just being occasional packet loss in the network. And, uh, we, we focused in on that and found that the cause of that to be in, in some of the switches we were using needed a, a software upgrade. So it's a case here where the, uh, the performance of the network, uh, for 2110 and media applications in general, generally assume that there's all packets are going to get through, assuming you know you have your quality of service set up and you have enough bandwidth on the network. Um, other applications like web, web browsing and email and stuff, if you have occasional packet losses, they just get retransmitted by the applications, and uh, you generally don't see that thing. So. Uh, need to make sure that all your your network equipment is is operating smoothly in that way uh, another issue we encountered in in bringing this network 
up is uh, it's important uh, when, in our case, we have, uh, I think, hundreds of audio channels running and a hundred or so audio devices, dozens of video devices. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be uh, in sync in this system. And so uh, uh, having a PTP Grandmaster that's capable of synchronizing all this stuff uh, is, is important. You need to make sure to have enough capacity uh, for the synchronization. The synchronization process is that the Grandmaster sends out a message telling everybody what time it is. And that's, that's fairly easy. That's sent from one device to every device eight times a second. Uh, there's a corresponding transaction from every single device eight times a second will then ask the Grandmaster, okay, uh, how how far away from me are you? So it needs to make a a, a compensation for for the network delay between the grandmaster and each device. And eight times a second from every single device. If you've got hundreds of devices, that can be a lot of traffic and can overload your grandmaster. Uh, so uh, the way to the way to deal with this is that of course you have uh, network aware, PTP network aware uh, awareness in your network equipment, and that then will handle these transactions instead of the grandmaster. It intercepts those messages and does the answers for you. Uh, in that case, then you have to look at the uh, capacity of your network aware switch, and um, yeah, we had that that switch managing a lot of the audio devices being the the boundary clock for for the audio devices directly uh, fielding those delay request messages, the, the re messages requesting uh, timing information for how far away a device is. And um, it did take a surprising amount of uh, effort for the switch to do that. Uh, so it's important to, to make sure you have the capacity for that before um, finalizing your design. So in our case, uh, there's a four core processor on the on the switch, on the Arista switches we used, and one, one full core was occupied by doing those uh, PTP messages. Uh, and then a final topic, uh, multicast routing. So multicast routing, of course, is used for all of our video streams in 2110. Um, Multicast routing is used for some control and discovery protocols. Uh, and multicast using is routing is used by uh, PTP. And uh, so it's important to get your multicast routing uh, configured properly. So there's an alphabet soup associated with uh, multicast routing. It starts with uh, IGMP, which is the protocol used by devices to ask for to receive multicast streams. Uh, protocol independent multicast, PIM, is the protocol used between pieces of network equipment to advertise what streams are available, the paths to get streams um, to the places they need to go. And then there is uh, routing protocols such as OSPF. Uh, and that's where the router, the routers uh, use that protocol to exchange information about how to, how to connect to, to different parts of the network. Uh, all of those protocols need to be operating uh, properly and be coordinated with each other. Uh, there's different ver versions of these different protocols that you have to make sure to get matched right. And there are configuration parameters like uh, timing parameters, hello time and stuff to get configured with all these protocols. Um, getting routing protocols set up is bread and butter IT stuff, maybe not for media people. Um, but there is a, uh, you know, getting multicast routing set up is, is not as, it's a supported universally almost in this enterprise equipment, but it's disabled by default and many IT people don't really know how to get it set up. It gets uh, a little more complicated when you have multiple vendors involved. These are all uh, 
standard protocols with RFCs defining how they work and the network engineers who built this equipment generally do a good job of, of uh, getting them to talk to each other. But uh, it can be complicated, especially when multiple vendors are involved. Um, and uh, there are some wrinkles with uh, PTP. I said, I mentioned that PTP uses multicast. That's true. But uh, the switches also have this PTP support built into them. And what that does is that when a PTP message is re received by a switch, it says, oh, that's a special PTP packet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out with that. Uh, if it had gone further into the switch, it would be handled by the multicast mechanisms in the switch. So you have the situation where multicasts you expect it to happen are intercepted by this PTP support and the multicast um, features in the switch were set up to support that multicast, but they're not actually receiving any traffic. And that can cause some configuration wrinkles that you have to deal with. And finally, this, this whole network uh, is a routed network. So we have a central equipment room, and then we have uh, half a dozen or so um, other equipment rooms that uh, have their own subnets. So there's routing between them. Multicast routing uh, will get your multicast between these rooms, but there is a range of uh, multicast addresses that uh, do not traverse, they're not routed. So an example, a key example of this is the, is the multicast protocol used by Bonjour or uh, MDNS. And um, so you cannot de discover devices across these uh, routed boundaries using MDNS. So any systems that, that use that, NMOS is one of them, need to be configured to uh, use a registry-based discovery approach as opposed to a, a uh, multicast-based approach. Uh, there were some, uh, several other, of course, topics that we, we've included in our white paper, um, topics about switch software, um, routing tables and IP addressing, um, monitoring of, of uh, network endpoints, um, we have here the, uh, the URL for the, for the white paper you can download and get all of those details. Kevin, thanks for your, your presentation. There are really some interesting points about uh, PTP and, and really merging a media network with a traditional I, IT network. Um, David, what, what, you know, why did you decide on ST2110? Um, you know, there's lots of other technologies out there. Uh, which ones did you did you take a look at as alternatives for this uh, solution? Well, originally when the project started, um, they were coming from a uh, you know an SDI uh, history, um, and uh, we quickly uh, went to ST twenty one ten from the flexibility standpoint. Dropbox is uh, uh, an IT company; um, they understand. Uh, th uh, Ethernet, <laughs> and um, there, it was uh, uh, understood that uh, SD2110 is coming on to the industry like a juggernaut, and if you want to be in the broadcast industry today, you're going to be building systems in SD2110, not SDI, uh, for future-proof um, resolution independence, uh, you know, uh, flexibility across multiple locations. Uh, there's nothing else that really made any sense. Did you look at uh, things like um, HD Base T and SDVOE? You know some of the other more AV centric um, protocols that are a little bit more network friendly. Uh, sure. Well, HD Base T is uh, is a great is a great solution, and we have some HD Base T uh, within the facility to do um, specific uh, uh, to take care of specific problems where they where they were needed. Um, it's got uh, um, it's not an IP based uh, solution, right? Um, you know, other, other solutions that, um, were, um, and there are other, uh, S, uh, video over IP solutions. In fact, we have some Crestron MDX in the project, uh, taking care of other specific issues. Um, it's sort of a mix and match, mm -hmm. uh, hybrid environment. 
Um, the reason for the SD2110 solution is that the, the broadcast equipment um, for live production is professional broadcast style equipment, which um, supports SD2110. So that's the direction that that product market is going in. Um, not every uh, not every corporate AV uh, project is going to uh, go for that direction, um, and so there there may be other um, uh, type of technologies like NDI that uh, could be appropriate for a project. Um, depending, you know, you have to kind of look at what the products are you want to use, what your budgets are, um, and then make a choice on on based on that. Um, Kevin, I understand that you um, had to do a lot of uh, work with uh, some of the uh, key vendors in this project to, to get everything uh, working the way you wanted it to. What, 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 can you tell me a little bit about your experiences working with um, you know, the traditional media infrastructure uh, providers vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the other uh, IT infrastructure providers and, and what your experiences were uh, relative to getting support? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, the way that support works in general is that you'll call into the support people and uh, they'll open a ticket and start working with you. Um, these media applications do have different different requirements, put different requirements on the network than, than typical, typical IP, IT uh, requirements or enterprise applications. Um, specifically, uh, there's a low tolerance for packet loss in these networks, and there's a sensitivity to, to timing. And so uh, if uh, there's a small amount of pack, packet loss on the network, that can sometimes be considered normal by, uh, <laughs> by your IT support people. Um, uh, obviously, you are able to get to networks that have uh, adequate uh, reliability for these systems. Uh, but you need to insist on on getting the help help to do that. Um, so yeah, t timing and uh, and uh, reliability are key. Uh, two other things I touched on in the presentation: um, multicast, uh, getting multicast routing set up um, is. Uh, it's not difficult to do. It's just there is not a, a lot of experience out there doing it. Most corporate applications don't require it. And um, the the other one was uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah, quality of service. Uh, that's another thing available in all of our network equipment. And uh, most of your frontline uh, technical support people may not know exactly how to configure quality of service or how to debug quality of service. So uh, often for these problems, getting the reliability you need, getting multicast working correctly, and getting quality of service configured, you may need to go to higher tiers in the support structure in these in these uh, organizations to find somebody who can help you well. So I bet you got a few names uh, added to your speed dial list uh, over, the, over the project. That is correct. I mean, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the right way to do support, I guess, is to call their technical assistance center and uh, get the next guy in the queue. But if you know the, the person that actually knows the stuff and can get uh, support directly from someone you know knows the problem you're dealing with, that that is definitely a shortcut. And we, we definitely made use of that. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Really well, helps to have um, somebody like Kevin on your staff as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, you yeah. know, he's an Emmy winner. I mean, gosh, I mean, people have to respect that. Yeah, I mean, the, another challenge is uh, the IT, the AV people will speak one language and the IT people people will speak another language, and you've got to have somebody who knows both. And and I'm, you know, AV people are coming up to speed on IT language, given all the twenty one ten that's going in. But uh, we do need to have that gap closed one way or another. Well, I'm I'm glad uh, you're doing that, and actually, part of uh, the the mission here for for Ames is to uh, help close that gap, get get the uh, the dialogue going in in both directions. It's not it's not just one group talking, the other group listening. So, um, yes, yeah, these, these sessions have been very valuable. Yeah, I really appreciate your time, uh, David. Thanks so much for um, 
given us a good overview. And Kevin, thanks for you know diving into the technical details. I think um, this uh, will be a really interesting presentation for everybody. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Now, uh, we're going to ask you to stay on for some uh, questions. So um, we'll open that up to the floor and we'll, we'll um, you know, transition over to our other uh, environment. Thank you very much.